I know everybody loves salary cap drafts, and if you don't love it, it means you haven't done one, so you should, because they're awesome. We're going to give you some tips right now. Dan Schneier just loves it too much, a little bit unhealthy love, I'd say, with salary cap drafts, but but here we are, Dan Schneier. Uh, sorry, I introduced you wrong. Welcome to the Mailbag episode, everybody. Hope you're having a great weekend. I'm Adam Azer, joined today by fake Mets fan Dan Schneier. <laughs> oh, you know, that was one of the most regrettable moments I've had on stream history. And that dates back through my time with 24 seven sports doing streams about the giants. It's been a wild last two and a half weeks as Adam can attest to, as we try to get this draft a rolling and all the events around it. And I've had to tune out pretty much everything, but our content and everything I'm working on. So it was a bad moment for me, but I made up for it the next night watching every single pitch. I'm going to a game again, my second of the season. So I, I have a long way to go to make up for it. I got a long road Adam, but in the end, I'll prevail. Yeah. So what are we talking about? Dan said, Dan described himself to me as a quote, diehard Mets fan. And we were on the stream on Monday night. And I said, I, he, he did not even know they were playing, which is fine. Like, that happens sometimes, but they were playing the Yankees and he didn't even know that. So it was just fine. You know, I love the way you're owning it. I love the way you're owning it. Uh, also, if anybody <laughs> wants to make a, a Creed, a parody of the song Higher by Creed, uh, in honor of Dan Schneier, I would love to hear it. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. And that, that's it. No, there's no podcast league spot up for grabs or anything. But if you want to make one, I'll play it if it's good. All right. And uh, we've been talking a lot about Tyron Smith. And just as we started the show, a report pops up on my phone here that Dak Prescott talking about a big pass catching role for Tony Pollard. Uh, but anyway, what's your take on the Cowboys who have been the efficiency for Zeke, the efficiency for Dalton Schultz, for Tony Pollard? It has been down significantly without uh, Tyron Smith on the field. So with him missing most of the season, it seems, what do you think about the Cowboys right now? Yeah, I think he might miss the whole season. They say it's going to be three months, but this is not an injury that's easy to come back from. And Dave Richard did a great job of outlining this on his Twitter. You guys should check out his account because he showed the efficiency drop off of the Dallas Cowboys, specifically Ezekiel Elliott without Tyron Smith in the lineup. That's who it's going to hurt the most, Ezekiel Elliott. And that goes for Tony Pollard as well. I think that is also based on kind of the past. And now I think it could be even worse. The Cowboys have had some options. I know in the past they've kicked well. Collins over there, who's no longer with the team, a really good tackle, went to the Bengals this offseason. Now I think the plan might be to put Tyler Smith, the rookie first round pick in there, or at least give him a chance. And from all the film that I saw in college, he's a very Trevor Penning like prospect. That was the other first rounder who went to the Saints. In other words, very handsy, very penalty prone, better on the inside at guard. And now that if they try to kick him out to tackle because they don't really have any other options after letting Lel Collins go, having to put Terrence Steele over at right tackle, the depth there is nothing what it's been. It's going to be a problem, in my opinion. And they're going against an NF now the division. There are a lot of good pass rushers in that division with Kayvon Thibodeau on the Giants, Chase Young coming back for the for the for Washington, and obviously Washington has other pass rushers there, the Eagles as well. I think it's going to be a problem all season, Adam. I am downgrading Zeke the most, but I am downgrading the entire Dallas Cowboys offense after this news. And Tyler Smith doesn't appear he, I'm trying to look this up. I don't think he's the youngest player from the NFL draft, but he's one of the youngest players. He is 21 years old, 21 and a half, basically. Um, so that's a, it's a tough task if he's going to be the starting left tackle. Tony Pollard apparently going to get more work in the passing game. That's not something we talked about on the Friday show. So I guess I've been skeptical that Tony Pollard is really going to have any start worthy value if Zeke is Same. healthy, but, and I still remain skeptical. Uh, but what do you think? Do you think like, I get the upside if Zeke gets hurt, hurt, I, even without Tyron Smith, because Pollard, yes, his efficiency drop, but it was still really good. It was four and a half yards per carry down from like five yards per carry, uh, with and without Tyron Smith, something like that. Um, I still think Tony Pollard, you know, could win you the league if Zeke gets hurt or or struggles so bad that they bench him, which I think is really unrealistic. Um, but I, I am skeptical that he has any start worthy value when Zeke is healthy, which is why I would take a guy like Kareem Hunt only over Tony Pollard. But with Prescott hinting that Pollard could be more involved in the passing game, do you, does this change anything for you? Nothing. I think me and you have been pretty in line on Pollard's value the entire offseason. I don't think me or Adam just is interested in paying this premium for Pollard. You can get guys like Pollard much later. Kenneth Gainwell, Daryl Henderson. And I don't know if I see enough of a difference between 
the Pollards of the world and the Henderson, you're paying less of a premium. And same goes for the K the Gainwells, even Hines, for example, right? Like Naheem Hines is a great example of this. What's so different about Tony Pollard than Naheem Hines that Tony Pollard should be going oh. that much higher? And you're paying. Oh, you know what it is. It, it's it's that people don't. No, it's that people don't believe in Zeke. And Zeke keeps sure. getting hurt. You know, he's he played hurt two years ago. He he played hurt last year. And but if he's Pollard, yeah, Pollard like if, if Jonathan Taylor gets hurt and Zeke get hurt, Pollard goes ahead of Naeem Hines by several rounds. I guess, but I'm not so sure they would lean completely on Pollard there. I don't know if he's proven at any point in his career they can be a workhorse for them. He wasn't a workhorse in college, and then he's not a workhorse uh, in the NFL. So, I mean, I guess that's the case, and I understand that. And I understand the idea of Zeke breaking down, but let's just listen to Jerry Jones on this. The owner here who's paying Zeke all that money is like the offense runs through Zeke. And yeah. I think there's we already saw last year, as you just pointed out, Adam. Even if Zeke's hurt, he's gonna play. So <laughs> I don't so I don't know, you know, unless it's obviously a major season ending injury. So I, I just don't understand the premium for Pollard. Yeah, it, it, round six. I mean, it's it's rich for a guy who you might not be able to start unless there's an injury, and then we know the enticing upside, but he's going just ahead of Kareem Hunt and Chase Edmonds. And I think at this point, you know, if you're just looking for a starter, it makes more sense to take the other guys. If you just want a lottery yeah. ticket, I can't say he has more upside than Kareem Hunt. I mean, if Nick Chubb gets hurt. Kareem Hunt's going to be amazing. So, right. All right. Let's uh, let's promote some really important things. This is all for St. Jude, all the benefits St. Jude, and for you to have, you to have fun as well. So, we've got this best ball tourney and we've got this poker tournament. Uh, best ball starting now. If you can get in a league, you, you still have time to enter the league, but you know, I think they're starting today, the leagues. And uh, the poker tournament is next Monday, Monday night, the 29th, Monday night, not next Monday, this upcoming Monday. <laughs> uh, tell us about them, Dan, and how to get in. Yeah, let's start with the best ball tournament. It's an FFT Invitational. We already have 300 people, about 300 people signed up. So we're competing against 300 of your friends and fans of the show, listeners of the show, and us. A few of us are going to get involved in that. I think most of us are going to get in on that, if not all. And so basically, that's going to be an awesome Scott Fish best ball style tournament. We suggest the $10 donation to St. Jude, but whatever you want for that is cool. We're going to have prizes in that as well. If you already signed up via the eBay page, because we tweeted that link out first, please, please reach out to me and Adam. We're having a little bit of trouble with the eBay page of connecting everybody and getting everyone's email. If that's you, and I know some of you have reached out, we will get you set up immediately. All you need to do is reach out to us via our DMs on Twitter, me and Adam, or via the fantasy football email and put best ball in the fantasy football email that you send to us normally with your questions. And then put then we'll have your email address and we'll get you signed up immediately for our best ball tournament. Now the poker tournament, this is my domain. I am really excited about this. This is this Monday night, the poker tournament this Monday night. It will be a live stream that me and Adam are doing. I'll be commentating on all of Adam's horrific plays and boy, does he make some bad poker. Wait, plays. I'm playing in it now oh you're playing you might be hosting it and I'm, I'm trying to force him to play in it we'll see if he plays in it he's definitely hosting with me but if it's not adam i'll be commentating on everyone else's plays we'll have an observed table so we can put your table out there if you're in it we'll have like a feature table kind of like a world series of poker thing so we'll be able to watch you well, you'll be able to watch yourself play we'll talk fantasy we'll talk poker and this is going to be a suggested donation to saint jude of 100 just like we did it last year Please, if you've already made the donation and on our Tiltify page, that's where we're going to be pointing everyone to. If you didn't leave your email, then please contact me and Adam again via the fantasy football email address or DM me or Adam. That's the fastest way I would say on Twitter. Our Twitter handles are right here on the screen. Otherwise, if you want sorry, to play. Hold on. For those yes. of you who are not watching, at Adam Azer, A-I-Z-E-R, at Dan Schneier NFL. That's a lot of owls here. At Dan <laughs> S C H N E I E R N F L. And you can also email us fantasy football at cbsi.com. That's the letter I fantasy football at cbsi.com. And if you haven't already signed up and want to play in the poker tournament this Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, please go to our Tiltify page. Reach out to me. I'll sh Adam just tweeted it out. And in the comments, in the comments after you make your donation, please put your email address. This is the key because once we have all your email address, we're going to send you a con uh, an email with registration details on how to play, everything of that nature. Prizes will be a spot in the listener league next year with all FFT people. And that went for $5,000 on our auction eBay. So if you want to get in on that and you don't have to bid for it, you could just win this poker tournament as well as a spot potentially a few other great prizes we're going to go over as we send out the details. So please, if you're interested in playing poker, reach out to me. I will get you all set up. I can do it over this weekend. 
I have a wedding on Saturday, so you might get some drunk DMs back, but they will have all the details <laughs> and everything you need to know. So we're really looking forward to it. Again, all donations, all proceeds go to St. Jude Children's Hospital, this draft-a-thon, and it's really fun. I, I can't wait to play poker with some of you. Yeah, also, we have two other podcast leagues that we started. Heath has a 14-team league. I have a 12-team league. You can bid on spots in those leagues on our eBay page. There's a link in the episode description. I'll put a link right now in the YouTube chat. All right, we're going to play a game called Favorite and Least Favorite. I'm going to give you a group of four. In one case, I'll give you a group of five. And you tell me your favorite in this group and your least favorite in this group. Joe Mixon, Najee Harris, Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones. Favorite and least favorite. Mixon, Najee, Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones. Favorite for me, Dalvin Cook. Least favorite for me. This is a this is one that's people not going to like. Najee Harris. Mm-hmm. Favorite for me is Joe Mixon. Least favorite is Aaron Jones. So okay. Jones is my second least favorite. I go back and forth with Jones and Mixon. I like the floor for Mixon. I just hate. The, I mean, I'm sorry for Harris, but I hate the ceiling right now. Okay, I, I struggle with Cook just because I, I think he's going to be awesome, and he is awesome. But the injuries, I just feel like he's. Gonna, I just feel like he could be breaking down. Just even last year, I mean, I feel like that he missed four games, I think, last year, and there's just more times where he hobbles off the field. Yes, and it just kind of scares me. Low key, low key was the least efficient season of Cook's career, yep. by the way. Yeah. All right. Next group is Mike Williams, Jalen Waddell, Cortland Sutton, and Allen Robinson. Mike oh, Williams, okay. Jalen Waddell, Cortland Sutton, and Allen Robinson. I know me and Adam have the same favorite here. Although I do love three of these players anyway, my favorite is Cortland Sutton. Everything I hear from Broncos camp, and I have a little bit of a Broncos insider, someone who's been at camp every day, and he's just like, look, every single time Russell Wilson gets in trouble, he's looking Cortland Sutton's way. It's not any kind of split. He's like, there is a clear wide receiver one and wide receiver two here. So Cortland Sutton, put him as my favorite. My least favorite is Jalen Waddle. Look, I love the talent. I really do. And everything about his profile as a fantasy as a fantasy talent is great, but I just don't trust right now to attack a Vola to support a two man passing game in, a, in an offense that at least schematically is based on the run. I love Allen Robinson there with, with Matt Stafford and I love Mike Williams this year. So for me, it's Waddle last. That was not the best pronunciation of Tunga Vailoa. I know. I, know. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't catch that. I was really hoping you wouldn't catch that for the first, like, it. I, I for the first it, like yeah. two months of him in the NFL, I was spelling his name wrong in headlines when I was on the NFL team, and that was an absolute disaster. Shout out Aaron Gray for helping me fix those. Uh, so yeah, Sutton is my favorite here too, a little bit ahead of Mike Williams, and now I'm I struggle with with Robinson and Waddle. I'm the only one in the CBS world I think that struggles with this because everyone loves Allen Robinson, but gosh, yeah. I, I just can't ignore how bad he was last year. The situation is so much better. I mean, he's clearly, he should be the wide receiver too. You know, I don't think Van Jefferson's taking that. And whenever Beckham gets no. there, if they sign him, it, you know, that's coming off a serious injury and later in the year. So I guess I'll put Waddle last, but man, like I was watching some Waddle tape. Oh, he's a freak. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing. He, he doesn't even need a great quarterback. He can be, he didn't have that great of a year from a yard's per catch perspective. I mean, he basically was like Jarvis Landry, but later in the year, you started to see some more big plays. And what he can do that Allen Robinson can't is take a, you know, seven yard pass right. and run 50 yards. Allen Robinson, I really feel like is going to have to catch the ball in the end zone. And yep. he could do that a lot. So I do struggle with it a bit, but I will say I'll put Allen Robinson away with Jalen Waddle. That's very fair. Uh, Gabriel Davis, Deontay Johnson, Jerry Judy, and DK Metcalf. Favorite and least Uh-oh. favorite here, Gabriel Davis, Deontay yeah. Johnson, Jerry Judy, and DK Metcalf. Okay. Despite what I just went over with the camp report, it's close for me between Gabe Davis and Judy, but I have Judy first. I really just love this Broncos pass game. You know, you give me a pass game where it's hard to bake in projections because it ha- they these players haven't had a quarterback anywhere near the level of Russell Wilson at any point in their career. Yeah. So it's really yeah. hard to rank them high based on that when you go for these initial ranking. And so I just think there's so much value to, to these types of situations. And I've always loved Judy as a prospect as well. And he looks healthy so far. I just think that whole passing game. So Judy slight edge over Gabe Davis for me last for me is DK Metcalf. I get it. Look, the talent is there. I understand. And the sample size of him with Geno Smith was not bad last year. It was pretty good, 
But then I look at this year and I'm like, how many times are we going to be watching this Seattle game with a coach like Pete Carroll who just wants to grind it to a 13-9 game at all times and just in a slew of punts, just a slew of punts coming I in a division that has a lot of tough defenses. I just, it's not for me and I'm just out on Metcalf entirely. I think I'm going to have to say Metcalf is my least favorite and I really struggle with Davis, Deontay Johnson and Jerry Judy. Is Deontay Johnson going to be the same type of target hog he has been? Right. Uh, I don't, I really don't know. I'm going to say no. Either. Yeah. This I is love his talent though. Root. I wish Gabriel Davis were going later, but he's, he's got a lot of helium right now. I'm going to say my favorite in this group is now is I'm going to say it's Deontay Johnson. Okay. He's really the only one who's proven anything. And I can't overlook yeah. that. You know, Gabriel Davis, I don't even know if he has a 500 yard season. I don't think he does. Jerry Judy has not proven anything. So I will reluctantly say Deontay Johnson, although it's certainly closer in anything that's not full PPR. I do expect him to have a pretty significant catch advantage over Gabriel Davis. Uh, Almonra St. Brown, Alan Lazard, Christian Kirk, and Elijah Moore. Almonra St. Brown, Alan Lazard, Christian Kirk, Elijah Moore. Who's your favorite? Yeah, anyone who's seen me draft this year or anyone who was in my home league auction last Saturday knows that this one is a clear-cut winner for me, Adam. I think this guy is improperly ranked, and that's Amon Ross St. Brown is my clear-cut favorite of this group. Not wow. Even close, not even close with these other three. Uh, Amon uh, Ross St. Brown is essentially Cooper Cup light, and he's in an offense with a quarterback who made Cooper Cup before Cooper Cup's full breakout, made him a pretty damn good high-end wide receiver two, back-end wide receiver one. We all just seem to be forgetting what Amon Ross St. Brown did over those last six games, or was it four games or six games? I don't oh, remember. Six. I think it was six, yeah. It was six. Pretty large sample size. I get it. Hawkinson's back and Swift is back. Doesn't matter. Those two aren't going to completely deflate what he was able to do. When you do what, when you do what he did over those six games, I think he was wide receiver three overall, correct, Adam? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 it was right around there. It's top five for sure. Yeah, it was top five. I think it was wide receiver three. It proves that you have the capability of having that kind of season or that kind of stretch run. None of these other guys in my mind have proven that whatsoever, though Elijah Moore is a sick talent, but I just don't love his situation as much. So for me, it's a clear Ross St. Brown as, as the one. The last one's tough for me. I think just based on my rankings, it's Christian Kirk. But, I mean, you can make a case for any of the three, I think, to, to be right, ranked right around that. I think Alan Lazard is the lowest floor, but also probably – or, I'm sorry, the highest floor, but also probably the lowest ceiling. So I'd probably go with Kirk as my least favorite. <laughs> Man, I, this is so tough for me. I'm yeah. going to say Amon Ross-St. Brown is my least favorite. <laughs> wow, what's – you and Dave hate Amon Ross-St. No, Brown. What's, I, what's your I, like him. I think I like Amon Ross-St. Brown more than, more than Dave, Jamie, and Heath. I've, I've, I've always tried to kind of stick up for him. Uh, I think if he had been drafted earlier in the NFL draft, people would buy into him more, but he was a day three right. pick. Um, and yeah, I think he hurts. I think he hurts Hawkinson a lot more than Hawkinson hurts him. And I do think he's pretty good, but I think, oh God, I picked these groupings by the way, because I, I really could see a case for any of them. Any of these guys in these groups as number one, except I don't think you can say DK Metcalf number one in that previous group, no. but, but like this one is, probably the toughest. So I'm going to say St. Brown is my least favorite. And I'm going to say that Alan Lazard is my favorite. I would go Lazard, Kirk, Moore, Amandra, St. Brown. Um, I think the other guys, Lazard, Kirk, and Moore have more downfield ability, can give you more chunk plays and score more touchdowns. Maybe not more, but the other two. Maybe not. Saint Lazard, Brown, down, downfield Lazard. Yes, I think he can make some okay. plays downfield. And most importantly, I think he can make some plays in the end zone. He's definitely yep. Red zone's big for him. That's the appeal for Lazard. Yep. Uh, the fifth group is five running backs. Oh, C- you screwed me on this one. Go ahead. Why? <laughs> oh, okay. You know why. C.H., <laughs> Damian Pierce, Elijah Mitchell, Miles Sanders, and Devin Singletary. Oh, uh, I've been trying so hard to come off this player. I've been on him for three years. The talent isn't there. I get it, but... CH is my clear cut favorite in this. I just don't understand how we're just completely overlooking that he's getting 
80% of the first team reps this offseason. Pache Pacheco's mixing in sometimes. McKinnon's taking some of the passing downs, not even all of them. Red zone, it seems like it's been mostly CEH, so that will mix in. We have a Chiefs running back who's taking 80% of the snaps, who has former first-round value, though that was obviously overdrafted. But he's still a player who can make quick cuts, who can set up defenders, and who has passing game experience and was really good at LSU as a passing game uh, specialist there. So it's CEH to me as my favorite of this group. My least favorite has has been and will be Devin Singletary. I don't care that he's playing most of the snaps in the preseason. Every, every, every argument you just made for CEH applies to Devin Singletary. No, because the difference is the Bills have a quarterback who runs in the red zone, and the Bills are also an even more pass-heavy team than the Chiefs. So that's the biggest difference They're for me. They're both very pass-heavy. They are both very pass heavy, but the Bills take it to another level. And neither level. of these guys are third down backs. McKinnon is, it seems clear. Correct, correct. Down. But at least CH can do it. Uh, I don't know if Singletary has the same. And at least CH has shown more in the passing game in his past, though not as much in the NFL, which is fair. Look, I understand there could be a massive blind spot with me with CH. I have overdrafted him for two straight years, and he has been a massive disappointment. But now the EDP has dropped to such an insanely low level to me. It's like, I don't love, I wouldn't love CH if I had to take him in the fourth or fifth round. Like even last year, he was going even higher. I think it was like second or third by the end of it in the first year. My God, that was like first round. But now it's like yes. seventh round. CH is still there. It's like, what? <laughs> am I really taking the Miles Sanders over him? I don't know. And for me, Singletary lasts because James Cook is an actual talent. He's the best talent on this Bills roster. And by the end of the season, I think Singletary will be in a role that we all are regretting uh, if we drafted him high. Okay, so I'm going to say... It's a tie for first place between okay. Clyde and Elijah Mitchell. Ooh, Clyde in there. Yeah. He is going to, I think, score some touchdowns this year. I think he's going to be their their goal line back. Um, but Pacheco looks like he might just be a better running back. But, you know, that's it's really not a lot of sample there. Um, yeah. Mitchell is, to me, far and away the best running back on the 49ers. Uh, in fact, I don't really like their running back depth. You know, they've got guys, but I, I don't know that they're any good. Uh, and I'm going to say that Miles Sanders is my least favorite, even though I actually really like him because he's sliding, but he's hurt right now and he's always hurt. <laughs> uh, I think when you talk about a player with, I do think he has a lot of talent and I think he's going to be on a hell of an offense with the best offensive line in football or one of them. If you can get Miles Sanders in round eight or later, and I think it's realistic. I do because oh, of, because of the injury, I think that could be a great pick. Um, but uh, he just can't stay freaking healthy, and it's really annoying. Can we talk a little about Damian Pierce? Because we didn't mention him, and he's in this group, and neither of us mentioned him. I mean, this is the big name of the fantasy offseason right now. He's skyrocketing up draft boards. For Pierce, it's interesting because me and Dave do the, the draft profiles every offseason, the fantasy draft profiles. We watch the film on these guys, and Pierce's film is phenomenal. I mean, he's showing it in the preseason, but I can't buy in at him because, one, he's on a Texans offense. Two, his draft capital. I mean, take a look at that. That's not a great sign, but that's less so important for running backs. But more importantly, he's never handled the workload at the collegiate level. So it's so hard for me to buy into this idea that he can handle this massive workload that he's going to need for where he's being drafted now. I've seen him be drafted as early as the fifth round in some of these mocks we're doing. So I, I don't know. Where do you stand on Pier the Pierce hype? Well, I do want to point out that he did not face 49ers first teamers on Thursday night. Right. Uh, they basically started a lot of their first team offense, but their best defensive players were sitting. So we still haven't seen what he can do against, you know, first team run defenders. Uh, obviously, he looks better than I than I than I thought when I looked at him at Florida. You know, during the draft process, he didn't really seem fast to me. He seemed slow. Uh, he seemed like a big physical goal line back kind of guy, but he doesn't look like that. He looks different right now. Um, so I'm impressed. I'm, I'm impressed he has zero competition, in my opinion. Not to say he's going to get every carry. Nobody does that, but right. he'll, be, he'll be the lead guy. Josh Jacobs is another player who never showed the workload in college, and in his first game, he had like 20-plus carries or yeah. something like that. So I'm not super worried about that. I do think he's a good pick in round six or later. Um, but I did say uh, Clyde and Mitchell are ahead of him, so... And you get you know, those guys around seven routinely or eight right. sometimes. So I, so I, I mean, that sounds a little... So I think I think you could take any of those three guys in round six, but actually I'd say round seven would be better for all of them. At round six, you still you're at the end of the of the must start wide receivers. You're at the end of the you know the Bateman, right. Juju, right? You're still in round six, you're at, you're at the point where I probably like the wide receivers better than the running backs. So 
I don't know that I want to take these guys in round six. I would guess I would say round seven would be better. But I think Pierce is just going to crush the Texans competition. I think he's going to have a pretty good year. And the running backs who often emerge from the dead zone, it's not uncommon for them to be rookies. Yeah. You know, like Elijah Mitchell, like Jonathan Taylor. You know, and, um, all right. So that's, that's my thoughts on uh, Damian Pierce. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk salary cap. Read your questions. Also, I'd like to point out uh, the draft board behind me. If you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> Dan Schneier does have a team. Uh, Not enough receivers for me on that team. So you've got your first two picks were Saquon Barkley and Kadarius Tony. <laughs> oh, yes. Your third round pick was How Ezekiel Elliott. I thought you got back on track with Zeke in round three, but then you went with Daniel <laughs> Jones in round four. <laughs> uh, you went with a former giant, Odell Beckham, in round five. Oh, he's coming back. You went with a guy who plays in the same stadium as the Giants in Brees Hall in round six. That was a steal. That's a steal. Uh, curious pick of Daniel Bellinger in round seven. <laughs> you took Tyrod Taylor just to lock up the Giants quarterbacks. Yeah. Around uh, you have Kyle Juszczyk in there. That was interesting. Then Sterling Shepard. Um, Drake London's on your team. Sterling that Shepard going to lead the Giants in targets this year. You do have Ricky Seals Jones, so you have the Giants' tight end room. It's not good because the they cut Ricky Seals Jones. So well, he was the only sec. He was the Can only. I trade other- him for Tanner Hudson. He was the only other sticker that I had. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Dan Schneier is represented. Fun What's fact, that? Adam. Fun fact, real quick before the break, Adam. I am only blocked by one famous athlete and celebrity, and you know who that is? Blocked on Twitter, Odell Beckham Jr. Oh, really? <laughs> Such a baby. I think I said a couple things that he <laughs> determined were mean. And then I check one day and blocked. That is so funny. Uh, I yeah. got to get a better story. I got to get the full yeah. story on that. You'll get the full story. Let's talk dig salary up the caps uh, right after this. All right. You called them auctions. Now we call them salary cap drafts. Let's talk about it here. Nomination strategies, studs and duds, or a more balanced approach and what it is. And Dan, you love this format. So what do you want to tell people? Well, give me the intro to salary cap drafts. Intro to salary caps is this, guys. Look, when you get that draft order and you're stuck with that 11th pick and you can look at all of the data that shows there is an advantage to picking earlier in your snake drafts. The data is clear with that. And guess what a salary cap draft does? It completely removes all of that bias, all of that unfairness of just getting that 11th or 10th pick and being at the back end of that snake and getting those crappy players at the end of uh, round three. And it gives you the opportunity to build your roster however you like. Everyone gets a budget of either 100 or 200 or whatever you pick. And you go around the room nominating players, whoever the heck you want. You can nominate Gabe Davis. You can nominate a sleeper you like early or a sleeper that everyone likes that you don't like that you want to get money spent on. And you can build your roster however you like. So the best thing to do for an for an, for a salary cap in my mind is create a strategy that starts with allocating a certain amount of your budget do this before your draft to certain positions, right? So you can do this based on your strategy. If you think that you can get, if you're in a one quarterback league and you know that, look, quarterback's pretty deep this year, right? There's, I like the quarterback 11, quarterback 12, quarterback 13 by ADP. I'll wait. You can allocate maybe three to seven bucks, even in a $200 budget towards that position. I've seen them go. I just saw uh, Kyler, who was it? No, um, who's the sleeper? Uh, Trey Lance go for three dollars in a one QB auction or salary cap with two hundred budget because everyone had already filled their starters and there was no one left to bid these guys up. So you yeah. allocate a certain amount of money for each position and you attack. And one of my favorite strategies for nominations is nominate players you don't want. Get money spent on players you don't want early. So by the end of it, you have money left and there's still the players you like left. Now, if you draft a RB1 and your strategy going in was, I'm going to just play for one RB1 and I'm going to hero RB my strategy and load up on receivers and maybe a tight end, then you want to start nominating all the RB1s because you're not going to be bidding on these guys. You're not going to be spending your money there. Get other people to. So a key to the strategy for the salary cap drafts for me, Adam, is to nominate the players you don't want and to nominate the players at positions you've already bought. If you've already paid for RB1 or wide receiver one, get all those wide receiver ones out there because you're not going, unless your strategy is to buy two, which is impossible. You know, I've seen some people go complete studs and duds on this thing and win leagues if they're really active and they do well on free agency. So there's so many different ways to play. One thing Adam brought up that I think is key. (laughs) It's a little trick, but if you play with kickers and defenses still, then 
be the first to nominate them because very rare that here, it's a win-win. Let me tell you why. Either somebody bids $2 and wastes their budget on a position that you shouldn't be spending on, or you just get like your highest ranked defense and kicker because you were the first to throw them out there. So right, definitely right. a good strategy. All the time, that. Right? So, so you take your yeah. number one BST, whoever it is, say it's the bills. You just nominate them for $1. And most of the time, you're going to get them. And if you don't, someone else is going to bid $2 on them and they shouldn't. And that extra dollar really does matter, even if it's a 100 right. versus $200 budget. I mean, you don't want to waste any money. So, uh, so okay. So nomination strategies, Dan touched on it. We would say nominate for the most part players that you don't want and that are going to go for a lot of money. You want money to come off the board. You want people to spend that so that you have an advantage. Uh, I think the most important thing for me is every time I've done a salary cap draft, whether it has been baseball or football, it's always the same thing. Later on in the draft, there when a lot of people are either out of money or basically out of money, don't right. have a lot of it for a max bid, um, you, that's when you get the values. And those players end up being the guys who go in the fourth and fifth round, right. you know, good players, not necessarily your stars, but though some of them could be, but I love, I need to have money at the end. I hate sitting out the end. So that obviously changes if it's like a super deep league or, you know, a super chef, but in, in most leagues, I do not want to be the one who spends his money first, or I want to be someone who, who saves a big chunk of it for the end, because you're just going to clean up with these values. And it's gonna be like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe Dak Prescott just went for $2. I spent $5 on Matthew Stafford a half hour ago. It's it's stuff like that. So it's not that doesn't mean you can't be aggressive with certain players, but I'm going to fill out a lot of my roster spots, four of them maybe, which is a lot in fantasy football, with guys in the 7 to 10, 7 to $12 range or something like that, and that's out of yeah. a $100 budget. You know, so I would I would not be out of money at the end because you're going to see a ton of great values and people going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this player went for this much. I shouldn't have spent all that money early on this player, you know, so so you can definitely be aggressive early, but just make sure you're not doing all of that too early because you're going to miss out on some steals later on. Yeah, a few more rapid fire tips. I think Adam nails the most important one. You want to have buying power at the end because you just get so much value on the Gabe Davises of the world and the, you know, the next tier. So you want to have a, and the best way to do that is just by having basically a core of three strategies. This is kind of how I do it. You buy three important guys and then you kind of wait. You just sit and you yeah, wait. I like, like, yeah, I like, that. like Adam says, you sit and you wait and then everyone's spending and spending and spending. And by the end, you have the buying power, which is the most important thing in a salary cap draft. Now, a few other things I would, I would put out there. One, never be the last never wait until the last player in a tier is left. So if you have, you need to get an RB one, you're waiting, you're waiting. And then there's one left. Guess what? You're locked into a bidding war with the other person that waited. And you're going to pay a terrible price higher than those RB ones. So never bet on the lat wait for the last player in a tier. Also, what's very important in this is early on the first and second players nominated tend to go for a value. Everyone's kind of got cold feet at the beginning. They don't want to buy the first player. So look for that early. If it's a player nominated early, that's not like I, I, McCaffrey. I think yeah, that, yeah, I think that is not necessarily the case. If it's a, if it's a superstar that's nominated early, if yes. somebody throws Jonathan Taylor out right. there, that he's probably going to go for, for a right. ton. But if someone throws Gabriel Davis out there, yeah, it's right. I say think it's even if someone probably. throws like a, let's say you love a, Aaron Jones, for example, yeah. someone throws an Aaron Jones out there early. That happens with a player like that a lot too. Yeah. It just can't be like the first or second ranked player. Then obviously you're not going to get any value on that player. Another thing I would mention here is this. If your whole strategy is, let's say I want to get Travis Kelsey and build my team around Travis Kelsey, but I won't get Kelsey if the price goes too high. Don't wait to nominate a player and just keep nominating players. You don't want. Sometimes it's more important when you have like a one, a strategy based on one player to get them out there early and see if you can afford it. See if you're going to take that player. Because if not, you're sitting, and this is not just Travis Kelsey. This can go later in drafts, specific receiver, or running back you like, or a quarterback. If you keep waiting and you don't nominate this player, and then eventually gets nominated, he goes to an insane price and you can't afford it. Now your whole strategy is ruined. You don't have a backup plan. So sometimes mm -hmm. it is good to get these guys out there and figure out, can I win this player? And can I build my team around this player? Another thing, oh. one final thing is, what Adam said earlier is true. 
if you want to, if you like a sleeper, sometimes it's good to throw them out there during the period where everyone's buying the high value players because everyone's kind of like, ah, whatever. I don't know what the value is. I'm just not going to bid on him. And you can get him cheap like a Gabe Davis. But also at the same time, I like the strategy, Adam, of if I've done this draft before and in my head, and, and honestly, sometimes you can figure out how these drafts are going to go. If you've drafted with your league before and they have values out there, you can use the past data to your advantage. But if I have a player that's getting a lot of buzz, but is way down, like a Damian Pierce is a great example. I'll throw those types of players out there earlier rather than later, because I don't want them to get lost in the mix. And it's usually a player with a little less hype than Pierce. I don't want it to get to the point what Adam was describing before, which happens in every salary cap draft is look at the end. No one has money except for one person. So then these guys end up not going for much. But if you throw them out earlier when everyone has money, they end up getting paid way more than they end up going for way more than they should or way more for their tier ultimately goes for just because everyone had money at the time. Right. So you're saying you, you want to nominate them and let someone else overpay. If I don't like the player in that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now I must say I've never done a 10 team salary cap league. Okay. So I don't know how my strategy would change except I would basically approach it. Like, we did a 10 team draft yesterday on Thursday and I took Kyle Pitts snake. in round three. This was a snake draft. And I took Lamar Jackson in round five, I think. So we had just said on the on the podcast earlier that day, in a 10-team league, you should try to be great at every position. So that means, you know, try to get a top how top whatever tight end. For me, it was top three, top five quarterback, whatever it is. Um, that would, you know, I would keep that philosophy in um in a 10-team league. But 10-team league, you you are you know, much better off with a studs and duds strategy in a 10 team league, which would mean spending a lot of your money on just a few players and then, you know, dollar, two dollar bids or whatever on, on some players to fill out your lineup or your bench. Uh, you can get away with that much more le- easily in a 10 team league because the waiver wire is better. And obviously right. your league doesn't end after the salary cap draft is done. So, but I, I guess uh, what I, what I said about good values being there at the end of every, every salary cap draft, I would assume that still applies in a 10 team league, but I, I play in a 10 team league every year and it does still apply. Now this is two quarterbacks. A lot more money gets spent on the quarterbacks, but even so it's still going to apply. This is just how the nature of these salary cap drafts go. Everyone just furiously spends their money. And then at the end, there's one or two people with buying power and the rest of the people are like nominating guys they want and they get outbid by $1 or $2. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You want to be the buying power person. All right. So I hope those help you. And we're one final thing, Adam. Mm-hmm. One final thing I want to get out there. Please, please, everybody, try it. Convince your league. Give it a shot. Play salary cap because I am certain of this. And I've and I want you to share your story with me if you do decide to go salary cap with your home league. Because every single person I've convinced to do this, once their league goes to salary cap style, they never go back. They never even consider going back to Snake. Mm-hmm. I really truly believe Snake is playing Madden on rookie level. And, and and salary cap is playing Madden on the all pro level, legendary level, whatever the highest level is. There's just such a difference in skill level when you have the whole player pool to choose from and you have to assess value on the entire player pool versus a snake where you really only have to assess value on the players going in your ADP range. Let's read some emails. Fantasy football at CBSI.com. Can you Thank take me. Dan Schneier? <laughs> All is right. That, is that where the Creed thing came from? I wasn't sure where you're going with the higher thing. I thought it was a higher Schneier thing, but then I didn't really understand the uh the Mets pulling, but we'll we'll get some good stuff because everybody no, no, has nothing to do with two, two totally separate thoughts. <laughs> you're, you're Everyone hates Mets my fan. entertainment. I am a fake Mets fan, I guess. And your, and your name rhymes with higher. So <sighs> and I have bad entertainment takes, apparently. Well, it's just that you don't watch movies. So how could we Did do- you see what I- happened on Twitter this week? My takes got so bad on the podcast, Adam, that someone actually tweeted at Heath and said, look, do we need to start this? You know how Heath has the threat of bad Azer takes. He's like, do we need to start the threat of bad Schneier takes? And I was like, oh, God, how did I get dragged into this? I am fine with that. Oh, my my mortal enemy is in the YouTube chat. Uh, Oh, no. And he likes to call me this. uh, (laughs) What a loser. What a loser. loser. (laughs) But thank you for viewing. Hit like. Uh, <laughs> donate to saint jude <laughs> yeah you loser anyway actually in all seriousness uh we have 161 people watching right now and only 14 likes so oh, please come on hit that smash that like button do us a favor that. 
Okay, emails, fantasyfootball at cbsi.com, then we'll do Apple Podcasts, and then we'll get some YouTube stuff. I had an interesting thing happen. This is from Caleb. Interesting thing happened in one of my drafts. 12-team PPR. I went with McCaffrey, Fournette, DJ Moore, and Justin Herbert. That is a hell of a start. And then Mike Williams in round five. And here's where it gets interesting. Uh, Godwin and Mahomes were available in round six. I couldn't believe either were still there. But Mahomes especially. I looked at the teams behind me and I thought to myself, I can't let one of these, what I thought were good teams, get Patrick Mahomes so late. So I took the homes, mainly to hurt them, but also to maybe make a trade when a quarterback goes down for a better player. So he took Herbert in the fourth and he took Mahomes in the sixth. Why are you, uh, you've been shaking your head since I started reading this email. What is your deal? No, I've, been sh- I've been shaking my head since the Herbert fourth round pick, but go on. What are you talking about? He got McCaffrey, Fournette, DJ Moore. Mahomes, Justin in the, Mahomes being available in the sixth is the exact reason why you can never take Justin Herbert well, in the fourth. He didn't know that. That's how it always goes. Mahomes in the six. That's not how it always goes. QBs drop. There's so much value at QB. You can get Russell Wilson in the ninth, Tom Brady in the ninth. What receiver are you getting in, in the ninth that's going to compare to the receiver running back in the fourth? I okay, but he still got Mike Williams in the fifth round. Like his team's anyway. I wouldn't have t- I would not have taken Mahomes in that situation. No. I don't understand it. I think wide receiver or quarterback quarterback trade value is less than you think. So small. One of the That's biggest fallacies in fantasy, I think, Adam, and this goes for quarterbacks or when teams overdraft a lot of running backs or receivers and say, you know what? I'm stacked at one position. I'll be able to trade is this idea that you're always able to trade. It is so hard to trade in season. It's going to be so hard for you to find any kind of value for Mahomes because no one has any depth at that point. No one can give you a running back or receiver. They don't if they give you that, what's going to be left for that? So, you know, they're just going to be happy scooping up the I don't know, to a tag of Ola or or or, or, oh. to of Iloa, or the Jameis Winston. I'll, Tunga of Iloa. Tunga of Iloa. Iloa. Or the Jameis Winston or whoever breaks out from that bottom tier. They'll be happy just getting that off the wire instead of you know paying that premium from a home. So I, I can't be more against this. Scott Fish is in the chat. Says, Ooh, wait on Scott Fish. All day. Thank you for being here, Scott Fish. Scott Fish, Scott is, Fish is a great guy. He's really the man. Uh, this is from DeMarcus. He helped I'm potentially thinking- save my job this week, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> from DeMarcus. I'm thinking about putting a priority on matching up a quarterback with their wide receiver, this SZN. I mean, really? You can't even spell season in that context? What's wrong with that? He wants to have a little... What's That's not bad. I hate the SZN. I always... I hate it from day one. You hated the SZN? All right. Yeah. Uh, which team combo do you like from best to least? Josh Allen and Gabriel Davis, Kyler Murray and Marquise Brown, Trey Lance and Brandon Ayuk. Um... At cost? Is this the question, or I guess not? I don't know. All right, I mean, Allen and Gabe Davis. Yeah, straight and up, Kyler. it's Allen and Gabe Davis and Kyler and Marquise Brown, and then Trey Lance and Brandon Ayuk. Yeah. Now, at cost, at cost, let's say at cost, I like um, Lance and Ayuk one, Kyler and Brown two, Josh Allen and Davis. There's just no team in a one QB league that I can see myself having Josh Allen on. I'm gonna say Kyler Murray and Marquise Brown would be my favorite at cost. Okay. All right. Let's Have you drafted any Josh Allen this year, Adam? No, right? Not at all. No. Of course. So, I mean. Neither. I would like to draft Justin Herbert because I, I think, you know, I you won't. can get him a little bit later, maybe a full round later, maybe even more than Josh Allen. It's just and too much I opportunity. Throw, I think he could win the MVP this year, for, throw for 5,300 yards and 50 touchdowns. Yes. I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. He, he hasn't. He's such a great quarterback, and he he's only in his third year. He hasn't had that career season yet. His best numbers are ahead of him, and it could be this year. And he could just be, to me, he even has more. I think he has more upside than Josh Allen. I know that sounds crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I think Allen has a safer floor, but I think Herbert might, he really might be the best passer, most talented passer in the game. He and Mahomes. Hey, it's hard Mahomes to are- not put Rodgers in there, too, but. You know how painful it is to talk about Herbert when I know that one Dave Gettleman, who is the worst GM in the history of the Giants, but also for some odd reason was right about Justin Herbert and absolutely loved Herbert, scouted three of his games. And then he just decided to go back to school in 2019 because his brother was coming to Oregon. And it's just so sad, Adam, because I know if Herbert had declared that year, the Giants would have drafted him instead of Daniel (laughs) Jones. And like we'd be going into this season with a completely different outlook. We'd be the next 10 years of my life, maybe 15 years of my life would be so different. 
And so it's just yeah, well, so you sound like you sound like the Jets fans who regret Peyton Manning going back to college. So. Yeah, it is a lot like that. It's it's a really painful experience just because quarterbacks everything and then I don't know where the Giants are going to find one, but hopefully one day, I guess. Oh, this next year, man, there's going to be like five or six in the first round. This is the best year of quarterback in a long time. Get ready for it. All right, from Cameron, who would you pick as a core? Like, which core do you like better? Core A, Dante Williams, Chase Edmonds, Elijah Moore, Christian Kirk, Miles Sanders, and Rashad Penny. Javante, okay. Edmonds, Elijah Moore, Christian Kirk, Miles Sanders, Rashad Penny. Or Javante Williams, Elijah Moore, and Rashad Penny. Maybe I should just eliminate those three. Yeah, I was going to say just eliminate All right. Yeah. All right, so then if you have Javante Williams, Elijah Moore, and Rashad Penny, which trio do you like better? Edmonds, Kirk, and Miles Sanders? Or Marquise Brown, Rashad Bateman, and Chris Olave? What do you think my answer is going to be to this? Definitely item? the Marquise Brown Rashad. Yes, definitely. For me, it's not close. Yeah, I agree. This is from Al in Toronto. At the beginning of this month, I started prepping for my 12 team PPR snake draft as I have for the last <laughs> eight years. But suddenly there have been a series of changes and it's become a 16 team uh-huh. salary cap. Draft. <laughs> and I'm in over my head. How should I use my money in a 16 team salary cap league? This is a great question because I've never played in 16 team for cap. And I think it's going to make a massive difference there. I think you have to understand it's let's say, so assuming the cap is 100 right now, and you could just double everything I say, if that, if the answer is 200, let's say, oh, let's go 200. That's more common. If you start to see in this $200 cap league, the top backs going in the fifties, things of that nature, wide receivers, maybe the sixties, the, the, don't spend that because ultimately money will run out even faster as you go to a bigger league is my assumption. I've never played 16. So at that point, you just want to be a team that can get a starting lineup that's legitimate. And you can yeah. do that with the value of those wide receivers in those tier three and four. Just load up and get your whole starters filled with those types of guys. The Batemans, the Gabe Davises, the Ramon Ross St. Browns. Well, in the world. I, I don't know. I mean, I would focus more on the Sutton. Sure, yeah, Mike Williams, gonna, those might be expensive too, Adam. I mean, there's yeah, going to yeah, be they will be expensive. Teams. Like, I don't want to make it seem like you should not have any great players on your team, and you should just save all your money for the end. I, that would be. That would I would be say, good. right, Adam. But we've talked before about maybe a three man core of top players. I would say a one man core at most would spend most at one player because look, there's so much money to be spent. And once you, it's not like a 10 or a 12 where there's going to be a free agency. The free agency is going to be unbelievably bad in a 16 team league, just unbelievably bad. So I would want to fill all my starters with capable players. All right. Uh, from Al, a different Al, Javante Williams in the third round or James Conner in the sixth round, non PPR? James Conner for me. I'm uh-huh. a big Conner stand. Yeah, it's got to be Conner. All right, I got to go a little faster here, Dan. Sorry about that. Let's speed it up. This is Apple Podcast time. No name on this one. I have the 11th overall pick, uh, and it's a keeper league. Should I keep DeAndre Swift in the third round or Stefan Diggs in the sixth round? Oh, I'm going Diggs in the sixth. I I know he said there's a lot of running back keepers, but it's 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 in my nature to go Diggs in the sixth sixth there. Yeah, you got to go Diggs. From Reg Miller. If you are really Reggie Miller, just know you ruined my childhood. (laughs) <laughs> when does it make sense to draft both Kelsey and Pitts in a 12-team half PPR league? You want to talk about fake fans, Adam? I am an admittedly fake Knicks fan. I will only be back into the Knicks once they're good. And I am honest and open with that. I will watch the Mets even if they're bad. I will not watch the Knicks when they're bad. I don't love basketball enough. But let me just say this. I don't think it makes sense to do this. The same thing we talked about earlier. It's so much harder than you think to trade. Yeah, I mean, you could, in theory, start both of them, but I would sure. say it would have to be like pits in round five or something. Sure. I, I, yeah, my answer was bad. Adam's answer was better. I agree now. From Arrow Row, um, how how would you rather start from the 10 spot in a 12-team, two-receiver two league, PPR, but there are two flex? So you have the 10 spot in a 12-team league. Okay. Kelsey, Barkley, Mike Williams. That's start one. Kelsey, Barkley, Mike Williams, or Kamara, Barkley, Kyle Pitts? Oh, this is like the order of how they'd be drafted. Okay. Um, so you're going to take Barkley in round two. I like Would you rather both. have Kelsey and Mike Williams or Kamara and Kyle Pitts? I like both, but I'm such a big fan of the elite tight end that I go with the Kelsey build. 
I'd, I would go with the Camara build. I like Camara a lot more than Mike Williams. I do like Camara a lot too. I, you know what? Oh, it's close. I'm just not. I'm not as sold on Pitts as a lot of other people are. I guess is where my problem is. Okay. From Charlie Hustle, subject Dave Matthews and four stars. Oh. This is in reference to Heath going to a Dave Matthews concert oh. and having his son draft for him. Are, are uh, you a Dave Matthews fan, Adam? I'm not, but. Neither is Charlie Hustle. He says, I almost had to skip this episode because of the inexcusable Dave Matthews take. Hated him in high school, and he still blows. Yeah. Um, I mean, every so, Jewish every Jewish boy who's ever gone to sleepaway camp has at least been exposed to a ton of Dave Matthews band, so I have been exposed to a bunch. I don't hate him as much as other people do. My favorite Dave Matthews song is Ant March. Ant March. I don't really like Dave Matthews, but I will say that it smells like teen spirit is considered the best rock song of the nineties. And I would say ants marching is the second best rock song of the nineties because it is to me. I mean, Dave Matthews is the reason we have like Jason Mraz and Guster and all these acoustic rock <laughs> bands, you know, it's they're, they're the most influential in their world. And I don't love their music, but I respect and appreciate their music. And he himself is just one of the most talented musicians. Unbelievable. And Ants Marching is like a next level song. It's just it fires me up. I love that song. All right. This is from Druba. Dear Dalton, Huntley, Flacco, and Foles. Uh, Nick Foles, Joe Flacco, Tyler. Yeah, what These are, are Ra Ravens quarterbacks. Ravens quarterbacks. Or no, Foles was Andy never on Dalton the and Nick Foles. No, 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 no. Uh, Tyler Huntley. This just doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. It, Small schools, uh, all from small school, all from division. Where, where did Foles play his college ball? No, he played at Arizona. There it is, Arizona. Yep, yep. Man, it doesn't even make any sense. And Dalton right. was TCU. And Dalton played TCU. Yeah, I, yeah. You lose. <laughs> I got nothing. Uh, all right, here's the question. Uh, I got a little carried away in my 14 team league with a late round QB strategy. Hmm. Four point per passing touchdown. Everyone picked up two or more QBs. I have a great team otherwise, but I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel. Who would you keep as your weekly starter? Davis Mills, Baker Mayfield, oh. Matt Ryan, or Jameis Winston? Jameis Winston for me, by far the most upside of this group. And, and a pretty decent floor, I'd say. Uh, from An Tuna, okay floor. I think that's almost the same as pretty decent. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah, it is exactly the same. <laughs> hey, Bart, Lynn, Brett, and Aaron. Those are Packers. Yes, they are. I have the second overall pick in my 12-team PPR Keeper League. I kept Derrick Henry in round mm. three. Is there a case for Eckler over McCaffrey, or do I go for Cup to secure a top running back and wide receiver? Yeah, there is a case for Eckler over McCaffrey. It's not a case. It's not It's not a take I would have. I mean, I'm going McCaffrey over him. But one thing that is not being baked enough into the McCaffrey profile, yeah, everyone talks about the injuries, yada, yada. Ben McAdoo is the offensive coordinator there. Ben McAdoo, the failed Giants head coach, a guy who did not really feature the running back in the past game a lot during his tenure with the Giants, was really low on that. They're just spread one-on-one -on -one matchups in the outside slants and flats. That's his entire offense. Maybe it'll change. Matt Rule might change that. I don't know. I'm scared of that. And no one's really scared of that. Also, Baker Mayfield wasn't exactly the most target-heavy quarterback to the running backs during his tenure with the Browns. So both of those two things aren't being baked in enough. Eckler's on a much better offense, uh, but I would still go CMC there. For me, it's CMC Cup, then Eckler. Okay. And next up is from Win Chris. I have a question about what running back to take in my draft. Second pick, Ninja 3 Keeper League. Mm-hmm. Is that just a typo or is a ninja? I have no idea. <laughs> it might be a kind of keeper league that we don't know, Adam. I kept Dalvin and Tyreek Hill and Javante Williams. So two of the running backs, basically this is Aaron Jones versus Saquon Barkley. Who do you like? It is standard scoring. Mm, I still like Barkley way more. Standard scoring is the only format I would even consider Barkley over Aaron Jones. Why are you taking Aaron Jones over Barkley, Adam? Can you tell me? I got to see something from Barkley. I mean, it's just the, the unproven. Gi yeah. The Giants are awful. Their offensive line is going to stink. I'm sorry. I know they made some upgrades. I think it's going to stink. Well, I don't think it's going to stink at all in the run game. I think it's going to stink. I think you have way too much hope. In, I think you have way too much hope in Evan Neal as a rookie. Right tackle. He's looked great. They're, they're so banged up already. On the uh, and as a run blocker, I should say he's looked great. And he has not looked great as a pass blocker yet. Um. Yeah, I just, I, I just feel like I, 
I know Aaron Jones is going to have an enormous role in the passing game and a very a solid this role. Is, this is standard, though. Yeah, I know. That's why that's why it's even a question in standard. Okay. I'm still going to take Aaron Jones. Like, like Aaron Jones's pedigree is not what Barkley's is. Barkley was the number one running back in fantasy right. once, but, but Jones was top five two years in a row. I miss the days, Adam, back in I miss the days in early July and June where we were still doing Jamie's mocks every week and I was getting Barkley at the end of round two, sometimes like mid round three. Yeah. And I was I was nervous to take him. From Ollie size, keeper choice, 10 team half PPR can keep for three years. They're worth a round earlier every year. I have Lamb in the ninth for a second year. I have Cup in the fourth, Marquise Brown in the twelfth, Rashad Penny Mm -hmm. in the sixth. So who would you take? Cup in the fourth round, Marquise Brown in the twelfth round, or Rashad Penny in the sixteenth? Ten teams. <sighs> okay, so these all look like people who are you can keep them again the year after. Um, for me, it's going to be Cooper Cup for sure in the fourth. Look, I can see him being another top ten pick again next year. There's nothing really to stop him except for Matt Stafford getting injured or retiring. That rapport is be it's it's amazing, and you have Sean McVay who's just lining him up in spots to get him open every single snap from those tight splits. So yeah, it's cup for me. Last question from Apple podcast is from shine dog. Dear cheese, Marlin Jones and strong. Those are max. Yep. I am in a 12 team super flex PPR keeper league. We keep up to two play. I'm going to skip to the question. Who are your favorite very late round targets who could be worth a much higher pick next year? Uh, keeper wise. So one of the best ones for me is Kenneth Walker. He's injured right now. So you're going to get him insanely cheap. And Rashad Penny signed a one year deal with the Seahawks. So he's most likely gone next year and it's going to be a Ken Walker backfield there. So he's by far my favorite at the running back position. Let's look at some receivers that I like super late Adam. That could be keepers next year. Any of those rookies that are getting bad hype right now in camp Traylon Burks running with the second or third team. By the dip. He's a keeper next year. Christian Watson, somehow just you can get him still insanely late by the dip there because he obviously hasn't practiced much. Same thing goes for Sky Moore is running with like the second team. So that's what I would say there. Tight end, nothing. Don't even bother. There's nothing to even think about there. If you're going to go tight end, at least take like a maybe like a Greg Dolchitz or one of the rookies in this year's class. But I, I don't see it really happening there. Quarterback's another weird one for me, Adam. I don't really see too much keeper. It value is super. Coming. It's super flex. Okay, I know. And even then, they're just still properly priced. So maybe it would be Tua, I guess, or Fields or Lawrence. But that's about it there. Okay, and it's time. I only have about three minutes left. Sorry, folks. Let's do some YouTube questions. Fire away, and we will answer them. Uh, This is from Michael. I drafted Pierce in the 12th round last weekend. Should I capitalize on the hype and trade for another underrated player? If yes, who to target? I think only if your league is full, if you can find someone in your league who's fully bought into the Pierce hype and like that fifth round range that we keep seeing him go, not keep, but have seen him go recently, you get like a fifth round type value for him. Yes. Otherwise, if you're not getting that much, don't go for like a random sleeper or underrated player. He's still, you know, we still like him. From Ryan, I need you and your help. Half PPR keeper league, cup in the second, Mike Williams Ooh. in the eighth, or Amonra St. Brown in the twelfth. This is so tough. There's so much value on Williams and Amon Ra, but I'm going Cup and Williams. Is he keeping two? You can only keep two. It looks like right or all. If you keep all of them, if I don't you know can. how many. I would. Oh, keep if you only keep, if you keep it one, it's Mike Williams. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. From Ben, would you target both Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon? No, never do this. I, I'm not a fan of drafting two people from the same backfield at all. You're just capping your upside. Yeah. <laughs> I think they can coexist, it, it, especially can. in PPR. I, if I'm going to do it, I, I think I'm going to have to feel like I'm getting a steal on A.J. Dillon. Sure. That was what I was going to say. If you can get A.J. Dillon two rounds or one round later than ADP, sure, but his ADP is super high. Ryan wants to know, if you're doing a 12-team PPR salary cap draft, what percentage of salary would you use on your top three core players if it is with $200 budget? Great, great question. And my, my typical thing is I'll try to buy a player in the low 40s in the low 30s and in the high 30s. So right there, we can look at that and let's say 35, 65, around 105, 110. This is from Mr. TD. Any general tips for my first Superflex League? Yes, yeah. general tips are do not wait at quarterback. It is a valuable resource. It's the only resource that runs out in the entire player pool. Get quarterbacks and make sure you get a third quarterback. A lot of teams skip on this in Superflex. Make sure you get a third quarterback that's playing. Yeah, I have, I have more to say on that. So don't wait on QB one. 
You mm-hmm. don't have to take your fir- a QB two with your first two picks. I think QB two. Uh, also, it's a huge difference if it's a ten team or twelve team league. Mm-hmm. Huge difference. Uh, twelve team league is much harder, and I think I'm probably going to have two quarterbacks in my first three picks, maybe two in my first two. More likely to take two quarterbacks with my first two picks if I'm drafting late. If I have an early pick, I feel pretty good about who's going to be there in round three. Sure. So I wouldn't be too afraid to take Jonathan Taylor or something like that. Uh, at, let's say like fifth. That's probably where I take Jonathan Taylor. Um, but I would say general rule of thumb in a 12 team super flex, two quarterbacks with your first three picks, you should be fine. 10 team league. I, I, all rules are out the window in a 10 team league. It's just like, they're just easy. I'm sorry. All right. Last question. <laughs> But I don't, it's not saying I don't like them, but they're easy. Best standard league picks. Adam was so today. thrilled during last year's, uh, yesterday's 10 team mock we did. He's like, I love this team. Everything's amazing. Everything's going great. And I think that's how we all felt in that 10 team. Sure, you better feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. From Jay, top four picks in standard scoring leagues. Oh, top four pick standard scoring for me. It's still going to be. I don't care about standard. Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, um, Cooper Cup, and Justin Jefferson. I don't care. They're the highest scores. Not for me. It's who's here? Who is here for? Who are you throwing in there? Taylor, McCaffrey, Derek Henry for sure. I'm okay putting Henry up there. He this is non PPR, and I would probably go with God Mixon. At four, uh, yeah, at four five. no, I'm not. Look at Cooper but Cup I am sure season last three. year. What's that? Look at Cooper Cup season last year. I think he almost it's had 200 happening. targets. It's not happening again. It's not happening. Yeah. All right. We'll see. All right, we got to go. Thank you all very much. Talk to you on Monday, recapping the rest of the preseason action and giving you our final sleepers, breakouts, and busts. Can you do me? Remember, write a parody for Dan Schneier, and yes. uh, we'll uh, have a great weekend, everybody. See you later. In and our yes, poker tournament. Poker yes, tournament Monday. Oh, poker tournament, yes. And yes, well, I'm watching House of the Dragon. Uh, that was another YouTube comment. Oh, what do you think? Very, very good. Very into a terrific debut. We See you later.